All right, we'll go ahead and get started, everyone. Thank you very much for joining this Native Prairie Speaker Series from the Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan. My name is Kayla Balderson, and I am the manager of the Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan. So every month, PCAP uh, hosts a Native Prairie Speaker Series on some topic of species at risk or prairie conservation or range management, anything along those lines. We usually hold webinars or an in-person talk in Regina or Saskatoon. So this is very exciting for us to have another webinar this month. So we have about 100 registrants uh, for this, this webinar. So that's very exciting. Thank you, everyone, very much for joining. I hope you learned something. Then our next Native Prairie Speaker Series will be on November 18th at the same time, 12 p.m. Saskatchewan time. We will have um, Adia Hassan from the Saskatchewan Conservation Data Center speaking about the IMAP Invasives program, uh, which is an online GIS-based tool to help landowners, landowners and managers and stakeholders with the fight against invasive species. So that should be an interesting webinar. Don't uh, don't miss that one. So we will go ahead now and uh, just mention uh, quickly a big thank you to our funders. Uh, thank you to the University of Regina for providing in-kind support and thank you to the Government of Canada, uh, Department of the Environment for financial support for this project. Uh, so I guess just a little bit about me before I get started here. I completed uh, my wildlife and fisheries conservation diploma at Lakeland College and then completed my environmental conservation degree at the University of Alberta. I've always had a uh, real passion for, for prairie conservation and uh, I've had the fortune uh, to work with uh, different organizations such as Ducks Unlimited, the Alberta Conservation Association, the Nature Conservancy of Canada, and most recently the government of Alberta. So I was part of the sage grouse translocation in 2012 and I helped monitor the sage grouse and, uh, and their nest success. It was really this experience that uh, led me to grad school. So I started getting in touch with stakeholders on the landscape and uh, building relationships. And that's really what brought me, uh, brought me to grad school to continue studying the translocated sage grouse. So uh, I'll go ahead and get started here. I should also mention, feel free to um, ask any questions. You'll see a question bar on the left-hand side of the menu. Uh, feel free to ask any questions, and I'll, I'll moderate those at the end. So, as advertised, I will be talking about habitat selection, post-release movements, and nest success of translocated greater sage grouse. So just a little bit of background about this topic. The Sagebrush Sea is one of the largest ecosystems in North America. So you can see a map here of uh, the sagebrush sea that I will be talking about. And it's located in the intermountain region of the United States here, kind of along the, along the Rocky Mountains. And uh, in Canada, sagebrush is located in the mixed grass prairie, right here in southwest Saskatchewan and southeast Alberta. So we have the highest densities of sagebrush here in the dark, in the dark green, and then Later densities of sagebrush as you kind of get along the periphery of the range and up in Canada. So to date, more than 50% of sagebrush habitats have been lost, and little of this remaining area is considered undisturbed by humans. And this is due to numerous reasons, and it's really the same story about native prairie decline throughout North America. Uh, you know, the, the loss of prairie and, and sagebrush alike are due to agricultural conversion, urban expansion and energy development, of course, among, among other factors, but those are some of the main ones. So there are over 350 species of plants and animals that are at risk on the sagebrush steppe. Over 300 species of wildlife depend on sagebrush habitat. And these are called sagebrush obligates. So I just have some examples here. Sage thasher, oops, sorry, sage thasher on the right, pygmy rabbit here in the middle, and a sage sparrow on the right. So these are animals that depend on sagebrush for at least some part of their life cycle to, to survive. So we have the greater sage grouse, who are one of the most imperiled sagebrush obligates in North America. So we have a male here on the right and a female here on the, or sorry, a male on the left and a female here on the right. 
And uh, sage rose have population declines ranging from 45 to 80 percent throughout North America, some parts even higher than 80 percent. And sage rose are really, really good indicator of sagebrush and native prairie health. Uh, they depend on sagebrush throughout their entire life cycle. So for every part of the year, they depend on sagebrush. It's their main source of food, especially in the winter. They nest in it, they use it as protection from predators. So it's really, you know, it's a really good indicator of native prairie health. If either sagebrush or, you know, if sage grouse are declining in a certain area, that's a really good indicator that something on the range, uh, you know, on the land is also not doing well. So this is a map of current and historic sage grouse range. So as you can see, it's very similar to the uh, sagebrush sea map that I showed you a few slides earlier. So we have their current range here in the dark brown and their historical range along the periphery in the lighter brown. So uh, there are currently 250 to 500,000 sage grouse left in North America. And they say that there's 75% of the population in about 25% of the habitat. So um, you can see some, some fingers poking up here into Canada, uh, in Southeast Alberta and Southwest Saskatchewan. Okay, and, uh, you know, a lot of the decline is happening um, along, along the periphery of their range. So sage grouse are the largest grouse species in North America. They are in the same family as sharp-tailed grouse and rough-tailed grouse. Uh, for those of you joining in from right here in Saskatchewan, uh, sharp-tailed grouse are our provincial birds. So just to give you some perspective there if you're more familiar with those birds. So sage grouse use what's called a lek breeding system. And so every spring, um, or sunrise every morning, the males will go into the uh, center of the breeding ground, or also called the lek. So an example here in the top picture here uh, of all these males here in the lek. And then the females will kind of stay scattered outside of the lek and, uh, and choose their, their male that they uh, will want to mate with, kind of based on the dances they do and the biggest, strongest males tend to tend to get the females. So this is also how biologists monitor their populations. So uh, every morning there at sunrise in the spring, the biologists will go and count the number of males uh, out in the, in the middle of this lack, and that's how they get a population estimate. And in the U.S., sage rose are estimated to have a $600 million economic benefit. So recreational viewing of these birds is, is very popular, especially in areas where the birds are still uh, still doing well, and uh, and also in some places they're they're hunted, right, where their populations are still healthy. So there's a bit of an economic benefit uh, here with these birds, which is also important. And greater sage grouse are really an iconic prairie species. I like to refer to them sometimes as the polar bear of the prairies. They're just that they're just an icon of the prairies. They're just very charismatic and. Uh, they are endangered in Canada, and they have populations declining uh, throughout the U.S. So my study area was right in the extreme southeast corner of Alberta here, right, right in the corner. Uh, if you're familiar with the area, there's a town called Many Berries um, in the study area, about right in the middle. And it's an area of about 4,000 kilometers squared, and the dominant type of sagebrush up here is silver sagebrush. So kind of a representative picture uh, here of what our sagebrush looks like up in Canada. It's not as thick and dense as your big sagebrush and other species in the States, but this is a good representation of what it looks like up here. So here's a graph of the number of males uh, in Alberta that have been counted uh, when population monitoring began in the late 1960s here. So, um, in about 1968, there were over 600 males counted on Lex. And you can see that population continued to decline, of course, with some, with some increases in here as their populations are cyclical, but the overall trend was a decline. And in 2011 to 2013, uh, 13 males were counted. And then this past year, uh, that doubled. Uh, oh, it over doubled uh, to about 35 males were counted just this past spring here in 2015. So, um, you know, probably partly a result of the translocation and other factors, of course. So, so we'll see what happens. But uh, a very uh, extreme population decline here in Alberta overall. 
So it's it's uh, the same story in Alberta and Saskatchewan for the most part here. The reasons uh, for the population decline, um, the primary reason for that initial uh, habitat uh, loss was was agricultural conversion, and the, you know remaining habitat is being fragmented by oil and gas activity and all of the associated infrastructure like power lines, roads, and pipelines. And there's a real problem up here with uh, remnants of European settlements. So we have all these abandoned buildings and farmsteads dotting the landscape. And uh, I'll talk about it in a couple slides, but these, uh, these abandoned buildings and farmsteads are really serving, uh, really helping predators expand into the prairies that uh, didn't used to be here. So, and it's really the combined effect of, effects of all of these man-made features uh, you you can't point to one thing with sage grouse decline and say you know that's the main reason for the decline. It's really a combined effect of all of these man-made features and of course some some natural variables that that I'll mention as well. So uh, one of these uh, reasons for decline is oil and gas activity. So I have a graph here of the number of oil and gas wells drilled in all of Alberta and the year here on the x-axis. So as you can see, the number of oil and gas wells drilled in Alberta really, really increased uh, here in the 1980s. And this does coincide with when the Many Berries oil field was put in. So this is an oil field uh, supporting about 400 active wells right smack dab in the middle of Sage Grouse Range in Alberta. So, you know, this was put in before the, the detrimental effects of two Sage Grouse were really well known and really researched. researched. So. Uh, so there is an active oil field right there in the in Sage Grouse Range that that did coincide with development in Alberta. So there's been a lot of research done about sage grouse habitat selection in relation to these anthropogenic features, and you know just the average numbers out there are that sage grouse will avoid buildings by 150 to 300 meters avoid power lines by 650 to 900 meters, and they are often found over a kilometer away from oil and gas infrastructure. So when you have such a small piece of habitat left and you have these anthropogenic features within that remaining habitat, it's really removing, uh, you know, a large portion of their usable habitat that's left. So it's really important to look at. Other reasons for the population decline include West Nile virus. Uh, this did hit Alberta birds really hard in the late 1990s and early 2000s, so that's a factor as well. Recreational viewing uh, is, is still a problem. You know, if people get too close to uh, take pictures of these, you know, beautiful birds on their breeding grounds, uh, these birds are very sensitive and they, uh, if people get too close, they might never come back to that lek. So it's really important uh, to keep in mind. And predators, so as I mentioned, um, predators are really moving into the prairies as a result of all of these anthropogenic features that are dotting the landscape now. So we call that anthropogenic subsidization. So this is um, things like coyotes, raccoons, skunks, great horned owls, crows, ravens. They're present now uh, on the prairie, and they 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 didn't used to be a hundred years ago, and they they weren't these these anthropogenic features on the on the landscape. So you know they they're using these features for nesting, for perching, for hunting, for dens, and and all those kinds of things. So it's a big problem in Alberta. So in 2011 and 2012, 41 sage grouse were brought from healthy populations in Montana and moved up to active leks in Alberta. And the deal was that, uh, that this population augmentation was to be concurrent with habitat enhancement. So I just have a few pictures from the translocation here. So uh, here we have an example of how the birds were captured. So biologists squatted around with big spotlights and tried to catch the eye glare of the birds. And then once a hen was spotted, they'd, uh, the light would kind of stun them and they'd net them, bring them back to the trailer. Uh, they took blood and feather samples and then attached these transmitters. So this is a good picture here of the transmitters. They were backpack style and we painted them to, to camouflage it a bit better to the bird. And so these were solar powered GPS transmitters. Okay, so that's important to keep in mind. And uh, so then they were transported up to Alberta and we just 
made sure the transmitters were still attached properly once we once they were brought up and then around sunset we released them onto the active flex. So as a result of poor nest success and high adult mortality, which I will obviously get into more. I'm just kind of giving you a bit of background here about why I got started on this project. Um, we were forced to look critically at the human altered landscape. You know, what's really on the landscape? What's happening? What can we do? So as a result of that, I cataloged all of the anthropogenic features in Alberta sage grouse range. So I have three main research questions, and the first one I'll talk about is how are translocated sage grouse selecting habitat in relation to anthropogenic features? So this is a map of what I just mentioned. Uh, I cataloged all the anthropogenic features in southeast Alberta. So I'll give you <laughs> some time to take this in. I know it's I know it's a busy map, but oh, sorry, we have Saskatchewan border here, right here, and the Montana border right here. Okay, so this is the extreme southeast corner of Alberta that I pointed out before. This is this is sage grouse range in Alberta. Okay, so um, we have uh, these black lines here. So these are paved and gravel roads. There's over 700 kilometers of paved and gravel roads in sage grouse range. In the red lines, we have power lines. There's over 400 kilometers of power lines in Sage Grouse Range in Alberta. Okay, and we have these buildings dotting the landscape here. Okay, so there's about uh, 100 buildings here. This is the oil field that I mentioned earlier, the Many Berries oil field right here, all these yellow dots. Okay, so there's about 400 active oil wells here. Okay, and then the green wells, the green dots are gas wells. So there's some gas wells intermixed up here, but uh, the main gas field is along the Milk River Ridge here in, in, the, in this corner. And a big problem we have in Alberta is aspen encroachment. Uh, it's, it's comparable to what's going on in the States with juniper encroachment. And up here the problem is aspen. You know, with a lack of grazers and a lack of, and a lack of fire on the prairie, we have a lot of aspen encroachment happening, and it's... Uh, it's something to keep in mind, too. So there are about 7,000 trees dotting the landscape here in Sage Grouse Range. So this is a map of the exact same area, and these are all of my uh, GPS hen locations for my study site. So, uh, so we have, you can see there's big density of points here. This was one release site, and there's a big density of points here. This was another release site. So just to give you an idea there of the, of the GPS locations. So for habitat selection, I studied summer habitat use. And the primary reason for this was because uh, the GPS transmission during the summer was, was, was great because these transmitters are solar powered, right? But right around mid-September and October, the GPS transmission really decreased as, you know, there's less sunlight, the solar angle is lower. Uh, the, the transmission really decreased and it didn't become reliable enough for me, for me to be able to look at habitat selection. So I looked at summer habitat use and uh, obviously took the nesting data out. That was a separate analysis. So I started my data, I included data starting May 1st. And this was to take a month out of, you know, to take out those post-release movements that happened upon release in April. So I took those uh, movements out and started May 1st. And uh, I went to about September 15th because that's when the GPS transmission started to decrease. So I have a total of 21 hens in my uh, habitat selection analysis. And this makes for just over 5,500 hen locations. So the anthropogenic features that I included in my model include oil wells, and this is both active and suspended oil wells. So um, if you remember the map I showed you there of the Many Berries oil field, you know, those active and suspended wells are in the same geographic area, right? So even if I were to separate them out, you wouldn't, you wouldn't see a difference uh, since they're all in that same concentrated area. So uh, I kept oil wells um, all together, active and suspended and gas wells included uh, active gas wells, abandoned gas wells, and drilled encased wells. So these gas wells go about to a vertical structure of 1.6 meters and there's really no difference in the sound production and so I, I was able to lump those together. I included power lines, I included roads, so I kept paved and gravel roads together and 
the main reason for this is because there's one only there's only one paved uh, road going a main highway there going through Sage Ross Range, so it wasn't enough for me to be able to separate them. Um, plus, I, the, the traffic would be about the same on these paved and gravel roads. So the paved road is a, is a pretty busy main highway, but the gravel roads are also traveled a lot with because of new ranchers and all the oil and gas activities. So uh, settlements means more than one house building or farmstead in an area, and buildings is just one house building or farmstead. Okay, and I included landscape features such as sagebrush cover, elevation and slope. So just a little bit about the modeling that I did. I won't get too much into it. If you want to uh, chat with me more about it, you can feel free to contact me after, but I'll keep it pretty pretty simple here. Uh, so I used a Poisson generalized additive model, which I'll just refer to as a GAM from now on. And what we really wanted to do was maybe a bit different than what biologists, uh, to be, what, what, what you'll typically see in the literature with habitat selection. Um, you'll typically, you'll see a lot of habitat selection studies that use resource selection functions or RSFs. And um, there, there's a problem with RSFs in that you're, you're essentially making up data. You're making up the non-use or zero points uh, across the landscape. And when you have GPS data that was as coarse as mine was, you know, these uh, GPS transmitters only send data every six hours. Okay, so that's pretty coarse data. So if you're designating points across the landscape as non-use, and your GPS data is only from every six hours, there's a high chance that you're going to be designating non-use points across the landscape that were probably actually used. Okay, so we really wanted to avoid, avoid that. So what we did was we modeled the GPS point intensity across the landscape rather than the probability of use across the landscape. The landscape. So we built a movement model. What were the birds doing? not where the birds might go, okay? It's a little bit of a difference there uh, in methodology, but it was important. So movement variables in the model included distance from the last GPS location, the direction of movement, and the time of day. So I'll show you a diagram of this in the next slide, but uh, we, we came up with uh, pseudo absence points or dummy points, I'll call them from now on. Uh, to make up the uh, pseudo absences around each GPS point. So we had a three kilometer radius around each GPS point, and this three kilometers was representative of the maximum movements that sage grouse made. Okay, so I'll show you a diagram of that in the next slide and it'll make a bit more sense. But it's important to remember that these aren't true non use points, these dummy points. Okay, they're kind of a pseudo absence that was used to kind of uh, to trick the model into, into giving us what we need. So we, again, just to emphasize, we wanted to understand sage growth movements and the choices that they were making by modeling the likelihood of finding a bird at a particular distance from an anthropogenic feature. Okay, so what were the birds doing, not what the birds might do. This is a diagram here of the methodology I just explained. So in the middle here, say we have uh, GPS point, okay, and this is the three kilometer radius circle around that GPS point. Okay, so all of these gray points are the dummy points, the pseudo absence points. So we looked at the distance and the angle of each GPS point and each dummy point to each of the anthropogenic and natural features that I mentioned earlier. Okay, so say there's a power line right here. So what's the distance of this power of this GPS point to the nearest power line and each dummy point to the nearest power line? So why were the birds making the choices they did? Why did the, this bird chose, choose to go here but not any of these points? Okay, so it's really just a matter of uh, what were the birds doing on the landscape? and the distance from each GPS point and each dummy point to the nearest anthropogenic feature. So I'm going to show you a series of graphs here that are the results uh, from, this, from this habitat selection model. So these graphs are uh, partial effects, so you can interpret them, um, you can interpret them alone, okay, so you don't have to think about they're not, they're not connected to any of the other anthropogenic features, so you can you can interpret each graph individually, which is quite nice. And so the effect here 
uh, is the effect is essentially the effect of the anthropogenic features on the intensity of those GPS points across the landscape. Okay, so again, you can interpret this y-axis the the effect literally. So um, you can say, you know, this this curve went up from negative six to about zero. So that's you know um, a six point uh, increase. You, you can interpret this literally like that and compare the graphs, which is really nice. Uh, you can, you know, you can interpret the, uh, the change in the curve and, and compare the graphs that way. So it's quite nice. So this is sagebrush cover here. So nothing too shocking. Um, you know, this is a really easy kind of obvious graph to start with. So basically, uh, you know, how you can interpret this graph is there are and there is an increasingly likely chance of seeing sage grouse with the higher sage, entire sagebrush cover. And that's obvious that's too expected to be expected. So it's just kind of a nice, nice graph to start out with. What I want to do point out here is that um, just a comparison here of sagebrush cover, which does max out um, around the 50 to 60 percent mark here. Uh, in Canada, you know, we don't, we just don't have that sagebrush cover uh, that, that you guys in the States do with your big sagebrush. So it's kind of interesting fact there to point out. So these are uh, graphs of distance to buildings and distance to settlements. Okay, so again, sage rows are increasingly likely to be found the further you get away from buildings. Okay, up to about, you know, 10 kilometers here. Okay, so not quite as high of an effect with settlements, but there is still a correlation there. So sage rows are increasingly likely to be found further away from settlements. Kind of stops around five kilometers here, but there is there definitely is still an effect there. Okay. Distance to power lines. Now this one was a big strong effect that's actually kept going up to about six on the y-axis, but I wanted to keep the y-axis all the same, uh, you know, for this presentation for comparison purposes. But this was a very strong effect here with power lines. Okay, so sage grouse are increasingly likely to be found the further you get away from power lines. Distance to roads, not a strong effect here, but there is still an effect up to about 2.5 kilometers, and that peters off after that. Distance to oil wells, so this is a bit of a strange one here, not what you'd expect uh, given all the research that's been done about sage grouse and oil wells, but um, you are uh, increasingly likely to see sage grouse until about uh, 10 kilometers here, and there's a mean, there is a reason for this. Uh, I think the model is picking up on the fact that uh, the main, one of the main breeding grounds, one of the biggest leks, is only located about five kilometers from the edge of the oil field. So you have a huge density of GPS points, um, you know, between five and ten kilometers um, from the oil field. So that's picking up on that here. So you're, uh, you know, you're increasingly, you're decreasingly likely to see a sage grouse as you get closer to an oil well. But once you hit about five kilometers, you're actually you know, increasingly like to, likely to see them, and that's because of um, that that main one of the biggest leks there on the uh, by the edge of the oil field. And then we have another um, another breeding ground here, about 22 kilometers away um, from the oil field, and I think that's picking up on that again here. So, so kind of interesting that the model is picking up on these things. So sorry, I'm giving it away. And then lastly, here we have distance to gas wells. So you can see the confidence intervals are a bit bigger here. So it's not quite as strong of an effect, but it is still there. So you're increasingly likely to see sage growth the further you get away from a gas well, up until about three kilometers here, and then that kind of peters off. So if you were to shove all of those graphs I just showed you together in a map, this is what you would get. Okay, so this is a predictive intensity map based on all of the distances from sage grouse to the nearest anthropogenic feature. So based on those avoidance, quote unquote, avoidance distances, this is where sage grouse are expected to be around the landscape. Okay, so this is, I just got this map a couple weeks ago. So the colors, you know, I haven't had a chance to play around with them yet. Uh, they may not be the best for interpretation, but I really wanted to put it in the presentation anyways. Um, so you, as you get into kind of the darker pink and the yellow and the green, uh, that's um, a increasing. That's a higher chance of you seeing a sage grouse. 
Okay, so this was one of the release areas right here, this darker green area. This was another release area here. So those, you know, high density of expected points are um, obvious. But there's some really interesting stuff coming up here uh, in this map that should be really useful for land managers. So we have a high expected density of points right, right here. And the birds actually weren't here. <laughs> if you remember the GPS map I showed you, there weren't any GPS points here, but the map is picking up um, some expected density of uh, some expected sage rose observations here given those um, given those uh, avoidance distances. So this is Pekauke Lake uh, right here, um, a big lake right on the edge of sage grouse range and there is actually an old abandoned lake right here. Um, so this is this is really interesting and it is actually I'll show you a sage grouse sorry a sagebrush map um, of the area next and there is actually good sagebrush habitat here. So this is interesting if there's anything if there's any features in this area that can maybe be removed and turned into more usable habitat for sage grouse that uh, that might be an idea and again here uh, south of the milk river here the, the model is picking up some more um, expected observations of sage grouse so that's also really interesting um, and we have some expected observations here and a lot of this land up here is cropland um, so this is interesting that um, there's some, would be some expected observations around here. Uh, maybe this area might be acting as a habitat sink, so maybe there's some opportunities for some uh, habitat enhancements in this area. Uh, so I'll just show you, show you the sagebrush map next, and I know this is awful. I should have all the black dots here is actually are actually water, and I should have made it white, so it's kind of distracting. I apologize, but. This is the Pekauke Lake here that I pointed out earlier, and the map is picking up some. Um, so obviously the green uh, is uh, higher sagebrush cover, and the yellow and the orange are higher. The uh, higher sagebrush cover, you know, the orange and red are getting to be lower sagebrush cover. So there is some good habitat in here, and uh, of course surrounded by some by some not so good habitat or sagebrush. So interesting what might be able to happen in this area to increase. Um, the amount of usable habitat for sage grouse. Um, so kind of if, you know, I'm able to overlay the sagebrush and anthropogenic features onto this map, I think that would be really useful for land managers to kind of to pick out some areas for, for habitat enhancement efforts. So my second research question was, are there differences in the post-release movements of nesting and non-nesting hens? So switching gears a bit here into post-release movements and uh, nesting ecology of these birds. So this is a map of um, <laughs> some extreme movements that one of our, our birds did post-release. So this is a two month period here, um, April 1st to June 1st in 2012. This bird traveled over a thousand kilometers in the two month period. So just to give you um, some idea about scale here, this is uh, so the gray boxes here is Sage Grouse Range in Alberta. So this is about 70 kilometers long here, just to give you some scale there. I should have I should have also give uh, these numbers in miles. I, uh, I apologize if you're a bit confused here, but so this is the release site here. The bird was released here. She did uh, some circles. She went north of the Cypress Hills to quite the adventure out there. Um, pretty risky movements. She went into Montana through the Sweetgrass Hills, came back up into Alberta. At this point, we thought she might be heading back to the capture site, but she turned back around. And uh, if you're familiar with where Climax Saskatchewan is, that's right around here. And she did eventually go right back to the release site. So really interesting that she was able to home right in uh, where she was released. Uh, we thought that was very, very interesting. But, you know, just in a, this is the this is an extreme uh, movement. No other bird moved quite this much. Um, but just just to kind of give you an idea of the range of movements that these birds exhibited post release. So on the opposite end of the spectrum, we have a bird. So this is one township here, this gray box, and uh, about 10 kilometers long. So much, much, much smaller scale. And in the same two month period, this bird only moved 60 kilometers. So really just a huge range of movements that these birds exhibited. 
So just to kind of quantify these overall movement uh, patterns for you. So during a 10-week post-release period, the majority of hens traveled less than 400 kilometers. Five hens traveled over 400 kilometers in 10 weeks. The average area traversed per hen was over 1,900 kilometers squared, but again, huge range these birds exhibited, anywhere from 10 kilometers squared to uh, almost 15,000 kilometers squared, so it's a really big range there. Um, mean linear distance travel per week per hen was 56 kilometers, again, huge range from 0 0.1 to 218 kilometers, and these Distances and post-release movement rates really, really far exceeded any other uh, movements recorded in, in grouse translocations. So really interesting stuff going on. Just to give you some, some other studies to compare this with, um, average linear distance traveled for translocated hens was 9.7 kilometers and 13.7 kilometers. Um, uh, for, for translocated hens. That was by Baxter et al. in 2008. And uh, Musil in 1983 uh, recorded 37 kilometers uh, the distance traveled. So we're far exceeding those numbers. And uh, Musil again recorded a, a home range of six kilometers squared. So again, much, much smaller than anything uh, than our averages that were recorded. Um, so a number, another study here that was done by Kemink Kessler in 2013, their mean median, their median movement rate uh, in the first two post-release weeks was 900 meters per week. So keep these numbers in mind here for the next slide. I'm going to show you 900 meters per week. And after nine weeks, the movement rate was 200 meters per week. Okay, so this was for translocated prairie chickens. Okay. And explanations for large post-release movements include many things, but exploring for appropriate habitats and resources and uh, stress of the translocation and the attempts to navigate back to the capture site. So these girls were captured in an area that, you know, the degree of fragmentation was not as high um, as, you know, as it is in Alberta. So, you know, these birds could have been looking for, for similar uh for similar areas and, uh, you know, probably a bit confused. Why is the sagebrush so much smaller here? You know, what, what are some of these anthropogenic features all about? So some, so some exploring there so that, um, so they could get, you know, more comfortable per se. And, uh, and obviously the stress of the translocation uh, would maybe make them not settle down right away. So here I have two graphs of the movement rates of our translocated hens. So on the top we have nesting hens and on the bottom we have non-nesting hens. So take a look at these movement rates here on the, on the y-axis of these graphs. So post-release, some of these hens were moving around 1,500 meters per hour. So that study I showed you, uh, those numbers I showed you last slide, were in meters per week. These are meters per hour, okay? So just a lot higher movement rates than um, than other other translocations that have taken place. Um, so I really wanted to compare the the movements of nesting of hens that ended up nesting and hens that didn't. So we started up with an equal uh, sample size here. There were 11 hens that ended up nesting in 2012, and 11 hens that didn't end up nesting in 2012. So a nice equal kind of place to start there. So as you can see in this top graph, it only took uh, two weeks for uh, half of the hens to settle down and nest. You can see kind of an increase in activity uh, around here as the nests were depredated and they kind of picked up again. But and then comparatively, it took hens, it took the other half of the hens who didn't nest eight weeks to settle down to that same movement rate. So when you have a population as low as you do here in Alberta, you um, that's that's 11 hens that aren't settling down and nesting and contributing uh, to population recovery. So that's really something important to consider. So this is just a different visual of the exact same thing. So uh, we have movement rates and nesting hens in the pink here. So you can see um, movement rates really decreased around week three, okay, and increased a bit here as the, again, as the nests were depredated, and we have overlaid the, the, the non-nesting hens, so it took them, you know, to about week eight here to really settle down to the, to the same 
movement rates as, as the other half of the hens. So an interesting comparison there in that visual. So my last research question, switching gears a bit, how does nesting biology compare to other populations and is nest success affected by anthropogenic features? So once these, you know, half of these hens settled down in nesting, uh, what was their nesting biology like and how does that compare to other populations? So the majority of nests are said to occur within 3.2 kilometers of a lek across sage grouse range. That distance has been disputed, uh, but you know there, there's a huge range of nest to lek distances, but that is uh, sometimes referred to as the average, 3.2 kilometers. And nest to lek distances are inversely correlated with habitat quality. So the, you know, the, the poorer the habitat, the further these hens probably have to go to look for a suitable nesting habitat. So I have a map here of all of my uh, translocated hens' nests in my study period. So these yellow circles here with the, the black dots are the leks, and the, the green stars are the nests. So um, these circles are 3.2 kilometers, uh, just so just so you a little bit of a little bit of a comparison there. So you can see that some of these nests were within 3.2 kilometers of a lek, but a lot of them weren't. We even had some stragglers way out here. So my average nest to lek distance was 5.2 kilometers. And again, a huge range of distances um, from 300 meters to over 22 kilometers. This guy nested in a coulee. So that was a little bit different and really fun to get to. <laughs> um, so I have a higher nest to lek distances for these translocated grouse. So that's important to keep in mind that maybe these, you know, since these translocated birds are maybe acting a bit differently and, um, you know, between their their naiveness to the landscape and them, um, it, 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 they might, they, I think it warrants a little bit more consideration when it comes to, uh, to protection on the landscape that these birds, you know, are nesting further away from black. So it's important to keep in mind. So suitable nesting habitat in Canada may be limiting, and this is probably forcing females to move larger distances to locate suitable habitat. So, you know, not only is the, the habitat not as great here, uh, and it's fragmented, and, you know, we have silver sagebrush, which, which isn't as good cover, you're throwing birds onto the landscape that are, um, you know, not familiar with that. Okay, so I think that, again, warrants some extra protection for these translocated grouse. And these increased search efforts for appropriate nesting habitat uh, could result in reduced reproductive success. And of course, as they're moving around more, that puts them at a higher risk for predation. So I had 22 nests initiated from 2011 to 2014. One nest was taken to the Calgary Zoo for their captive breeding program. So that isn't included in my nest success calculations. So just if you're wondering why numbers don't add up, that's why. So I had 15 unsuccessful nests, all due to predation, and I had six successful nests. So since the exact start and end dates were known for the nests, so the GPS transmission during the summer was so good, and I also want to point out that um, even, uh, even if I had a few points, a few clumps of points uh, transmitted, I would go out and look at that clump, every clump of points to see if it was a nest. Uh, so I'm very confident that we did catch all of the nests and therefore didn't have to do any Mayfield estimators. Uh, so I was just able to calculate actual nest success, which was the easiest math I ever did for my master's, 6 over 21, 29%. Uh, so we can estimate nest success for these translocated birds in my study time to be about 29%. So stable populations do have higher nesting success. Nest success throughout sage grouse range in North America ranges from 35 to 86%. So we are on the low end there of nest success. And of course, nest success is lower in silver sagebrush habitats, and low nest success is also related to fragmented habitats. So, you know, we have both up here. This is a picture of silver sagebrush on the left and big sagebrush found in the States on the right. So you can see there's an obvious difference there. In the protection that sage grouse nests are afforded here uh, between big and silver sagebrush. And of course, once the habitats are fragmented, you have a higher chance of predators moving in and all that. So it's so not surprising that we have a bit lower nesting, nesting success up here. So I wanted to show you this graph here uh, to show you the difference between uh, translocated hens versus what 
what we would call integrated hens um, one year after translocation. So in 2011, um, we had two nests initiated, so it was 50%. We had four that were actively transmitting. Same thing in 2012 after the release, we had 11 out of 22 hens initiate nests, but the nest success was really low. Um, one of those, again, these are such small sample sizes, it's really hard to, to draw any solid conclusions, but they are still trends. So uh, we have, and then in 2012, we had only one out of the 11 nests uh, be successful, so that was really low. And then, you know, once in once these hens are one year post release or you know integrated hens, they should be exhibiting closer to what native hens in a healthy population would would exhibit. Um, so that's closer to 100% nest initiation. And we didn't get quite there in 2013 with only four out of nine hens initiating nests, and uh, two of those were successful. We did get there in 2014, but I mean, there were only three actively transmitting hens, so, you know, it's really hard with this small sample size to, to draw any conclusions, but um, just a little bit of a comparison there. And uh, Dr. Cameron Aldridge uh, studied native sage-grouse hens in, in southeast Alberta in the late 1990s and early 2000s, and when he studied native sage-grouse, uh, he had 100% nest initiation and 46% nest success. So a little bit of an interesting comparison there that our nest initiation and nest success were lower than native hens in, uh, in Alberta. So uh, lastly here, I looked at the logistic regression. Uh, I used logistic regression to evaluate the impact of anthropogenic features on the probability of nest success. So a lot of this below here is uh, is garbage. You don't need to look at it, but um, I will just point out that I did include some biological factors uh, in the model. So I looked at age, juvenile or adult. Uh, I looked at the weight of the hen upon capture and nest initiation dates. So I looked at age and weight because we were interested in seeing if there were, if there could be any kind of strategy upon capture of these hens. Should we be capturing juveniles or adults or you know, bigger or smaller hens, and nothing nothing came out uh, as, as significant in the model. But again, you know, small sample size, so it, it is hard to say. Um, so uh, above the null model here, uh, we have trees and power lines that came out as the top models. So, um, you know, again, very hard to, to pull out anything significant when the sample sizes are this small. So we have some trends here. They're very weak trends, but they are trends. So if what's interesting here is the negative parameter estimate. So this is saying that the closer a nest was it were to trees or power lines, the increased chance it had of succeeding. Okay, so a little counterintuitive there, not what you would think, and I think this is kind of a, a result of a couple things. I think firstly, the, the hens being a little bit naive to the landscape and unfamiliar with a lot of the anthropogenic features on the landscape, so they may not have been recognizing some of these features as threats. So that could be a factor, and also there may have been good sagebrush habitat around some of these features. Uh, you know, thereby drawing them to nest there, but maybe acting as a habitat sink. So interesting things going on. Maybe these translocated hens aren't uh, recognizing some of these uh, features on the landscape as threats. So just some conclusions here to review uh, what I just talked about. Uh, there is a higher likelihood that sage grouse will be found further away from every man-made feature, feature. And there was a little bit of an exception here with the oil wells uh, past a certain distance, but again, um, that was because of the, the high density of GPS points around the one of the main breeding grounds there that wasn't that far away from the many berries oil field. So the model's picking up on that. Um, one of the strongest effects um, on sage rose habitat selection was distance from power lines. And the predictive surface maps that I showed you will really help pinpoint priority priority areas for our habitat enhancement efforts. 50% of translocated hens did not nest during the release year and have significantly higher movement rates. So again, this is really significant when you have a low population and half of the hens you bring up aren't nesting and contributing to the population, 
that, you know, it's it's not as beneficial as it could be, right? And these translocated sage grouse hens had larger nest to like distances compared to populations across their range. Nest success was low, about 29%. Anthropogenic features are likely not negatively affecting nest success. And suitable habitat around trees and power lines may be attracting sage grouse and acting as a habitat sink. So main recommendations stemming from my research are to bury power lines underground in key nesting habitat and reclaim wells close to breeding grounds. And uh, I will just mention that Fortis, Alberta did relocate some power lines uh, within close proximity to Lex last year. Um, ideally, though, these power lines should be just buried underground because they're, um, they're selecting habitat uh, further away from power lines. So I think it's ideal to bury them underground. Consider artificial insemination of sage grouse during capture. So if we're ensuring that these sage grouse are inseminated before we bring them up and release them, uh, you could likely decrease the chance of some of these extreme post-release movements that we saw and increase the chance of more hens settling down and nesting right away. So um, this is something that's been recommended and talked about for a long time, and it is a uh, I think it is currently uh, taking place. There's a research project on a, on a Colombian uh, sharp-tailed grouse right now. So be a really interesting project to see how that goes. Um, if if you you know if if we can have more translocated hens nesting uh, and more hens contributing to the population, that's going to be really really beneficial for for small populations that are doing translocations. Uh, current guidelines in Alberta restrict activity within 3.2 kilometers, and I think we need larger restrictions to protect more of these translocated nests from disturbance because they're they're not acting quite the same as native hens, right? Um, restoration and reclamation of activity should be focused in key nesting habitat to really, you know, to really uh, as increase uh, nest success as much as we can here. And again, this should be about at least five kilometers around. Uh, lex or more to really protect more of these of these nests from translocated hens. All right, so I would like to uh, end off here acknowledging uh, some people. My co-supervisors, Dr. Mark Brigham at the University of Regina, Dr. Stephen Davis with Environment Canada, and Dr. Axel Marnschlager with the Calgary Zoo. And also a huge thank you to Dr. Gavin Simpson at the University of Regina. He, Regina, he was just uh, an integral part of of my movement models. I wouldn't have been able to do them without him. So huge thank you to him. Thank you to uh, Enser Post and Grad Postgraduate Industrial Scholarship Program and my industrial partner, the City of Medicine Hat Natural Gas and Petroleum Resources. And on that, we're running a bit late here. So if you have any questions please, please, please feel free to uh, email me at pcap, p-c-a-p, at sasktel.net. That's p-c-a-p at sasktel.net. Or give me a shout. I'd love, I'd love to hear from, uh, from anyone and talk more about anything that you want to. Uh, you can phone me at 306-450-7977. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining. I, I, hope, I hope you all learned something. And again, I'd just like to recognize uh, the University of Regina for in-kind support and the Government of Canada, Federal Department of the Environment, for your financial support. And I'm just going to take a second here to uh, show you our website. So if you go to um, our, our website here, pcap-sk.org, um, on the bottom of the page, you will be able to find the links to our social media. So we are Facebook, on Twitter, and our YouTube page here. So you can follow us for events and more speaker series and see what we have going on. And if you go under the Communications tab and hit Native Prairie Speaker Series, this is where the link to my presentation will be here. So please feel free to pass that on to anyone who wasn't able to miss this, or who wasn't able to see this and who might be wanting to, to watch it later. So. Uh, the link will be will be here to my presentation on YouTube. And I'd just like to second to talk about our upcoming Prairie Conservation and Endangered Species Conference. So uh, this is a conference that happens one every th once every three years in the Prairie Provinces here. It rotates between Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. 
So this year uh, it will be in Saskatoon and uh, PCAP is helping to organize it. So this will be February 16th to 18th in Saskatoon. So if you're interested in finding out more about that, feel free to email me and you can register here too. Early bird registration is until January 15th. So take advantage of that if you're interested in coming. All right, well, I will end off here. Please, again, feel free to email me, pcap, P-C-A-P, at sastel.net if you want to talk more um, about my research or, or anything else for that matter. Thank you very much for joining. Have a good rest of your day.